some missionary news that I'd like to share with you. First of all, I got a letter, and this letter is uh, not to most of you, but to our kids, uh, to Ari and Jacob and Kelsey and Micah, Rachel, Wesley, and Nathan. If you're here, this was written from the Lozier's. They're our church, missionary church builders over in Geneseo. And uh, they just write and said, thank you so much for your card and prayers. It made us smile to open and read it. The Lord keeps us safe working with all the tools. He also gives us strength for each day, and he has kept us healthy. We serve a wonderful God. Amen. With love from the Lozier's to our junior church kids. And, uh, and then uh, the Marshalls, Rich and Anna Marshall, are serving over in Mali, Timbuktu. Uh, we know they'd come home for a few weeks, um, and his dad was uh, on death's door, but they had to go back because of their visa situation. And, um, and then on uh, the 13th of May, just uh, a week ago, they got word, and they hadn't hardly got back, but uh, uh, his dad went to, to be with the Lord in glory. And uh, so they said, we write to you and uh, tell you great news. Dad Marshall's gone to his heavenly home. And then the next day, May 14th, which is the last Thursday, uh, we just received great news from our transitor who's working on our customs paperwork. Uh, and this is the great news. The Minister of Economy and Finances has granted a complete exoneration of customs on the whole container, including the truck. Uh, so all the stuff they sent back. This is such great news to us and a huge saving of finances that can now be used in the well drilling ministry. Thank you so much for your prayers. The truck is scheduled to leave the car tomorrow. But pray for its safety and that the paperwork won't pose a problem at the border. How many prayed for the safety of that container? Good. You didn't pray hard enough because Tuesday we got this. It's just past Tuesday. We just got word from our transitor that the container is sitting on the border between Senegal and Mali. Paperwork problems. So make that a matter of prayer. Continually, because just this morning at 3.23 a.m., we got this email that the container, praise the Lord, the container is now sitting in Qatari, which is just outside the city limits of Bamako, paperwork incomplete. So, so they're working on it. Don't stop praying for the Marshall's ministry. Yeah, they're in, in, in Mali. Uh, and then Milton and Evelyn Williams uh, sent a note also. They're ministering in Grenada. He's no longer the pastor of uh, the church there, the one church, but is sort of overseeing and counseling and helping in all four of the little churches over there. Um, but he, he, he writes and says this. He says, concerning the churches in general, the work is not growing. As I mentioned before, there's a lack of interest on the part of the unsaved people, and some Christians are not always walking uprightly. This could be one of the major causes for the lack of interest on the part of the unsaved. Please remember this in your prayers. Well, he's not alone in that. There's a lot of churches in America that are struggling just the same, um, where there's a, a lack of evangelism or fruit in their evangelism to the unsaved. And, and even among the Christians, there are some that there's a lack of commitment and just aren't walking in obedience to the Lord of God. So. So uh, as you think of Milton and Evelyn Williams there in Grenada, uh, pray, for, pray for their ministry and the churches there that God would do a great work with that. That's just a quote. Our, our quote now, speaking of quotes, quote now, the second half of the verses on the Lord's coming we were going to start tonight. How many are ready for that? Three of us. Four of us that I know of. Okay. Okay. Um, We'll, we'll postpone this a week or two just to allow a few more people to be ready. Uh, just go on our church website, which is Grace Baptist Marion, all one word, gracebaptistmarion.info, and uh, you can download those verses, and we encourage you to, to memorize those. Challenge someone else to memorize them. I have put out a challenge to those in the men's Bible study, and so I assume given another week or two, they'll be all ready. <laughs> Tonight, 6 o'clock, our evening service, it will be, uh, we're studying these uh, difficult study uh, subject matters. Uh, it's on cremation, to bury or to burn, that is the question. A hot topic. <laughs> By the way, this is a Hindu cremation shown here. All right, Roger has an announcement for us. Okay. I didn't get put in the bulletin, but men's work day is next Saturday night. Um, 
I'd like to try to have at least 10 to 9 or 10 to 12 guys, if possible. Um, I have the guys that are going to be on the roof, Joel, Pastor, and Ted, volunteer to go up on the garage roof. But I'm going to need some guys on the ground, and we've got some other work. Um, I'm going to give you a list. We're going to need one chainsaw, you know, bring tape measures, hammers, guard brakes, uh, a couple nail pouches, and wear gloves because those guys work on the roof. Gloves, and we need cordless drills. Whoever has cordless drills, just bring them in. Bring if you have extra batteries and a charger. I really don't think you'll you know, run the battery dead, but it's better to be safe. Okay. Excellent. 9 a.m. Saturday morning. Yep. Good. Thank you, Roger. Uh, ladies have a luncheon also uh, this Thursday at the 1 p.m. at the SNL Diner in Marion. Uh, meet there for lunch. Any, many of the ladies are invited, and then you'll go over to Shirley's, I guess, for dessert. That's always good. You wouldn't want to miss that. Uh, and then uh, today, after church at the SNL Diner, uh, we're having a planning meeting for one of our VBSs. We have two. For a number of years, we actually ran two VBSs. We had a Children's Day camp that my mom did, and Tom and Ruth Diamond are continuing that. So we're having uh, the Child's Day camp still, and then we're also going to have a family. Uh, VBS in the evening this year. Um, we're going to try uh, an outreach family VBS. Anyways, we're going to do the planning. If you're interested in helping or planning that, uh, after church at the SNL Diner, we're going to meet today. All right? Uh, and then Wednesday night, always prayer meeting. Really important for God's people to be together praying. Uh, but we're also having a meeting of junior church meetings. Is that correct, Rachel? Yeah. Junior church, if you could help out and serve in that ministry, we hope you can. Uh, be a short meeting um, for you Wednesday night as well. And Brother Grant is speaking during the devotionals Wednesday night, so we look forward to that. All right. Any other announcements? Ruth? We, we still need cookies for the craft show. Okay, for the cruising. Oh, craft for the craft show. show. Okay. So see, Ruth brought that, but I saw on the sign we've already got the cruising uh, schedule too, so uh, that's good. All right. All right. Let's take our hymn books and sing another hymn, 505. Oh, that will be glory. Thank you.
Father, uh, regardless of the weather outside, it is always a joy to be here. And, uh, it is a beautiful day, Lord. Um, we just pray for these tithes and offerings that they can put forward for your use. We just pray for this morning's service that it will be a blessing for all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Director of Compass 2819 is going, 
as well as Jason Jackson, youth pastor at Heritage Baptist Church on Clark Summit. My son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, there are college kids that are going. Um, many of them get credit to do this course for two weeks. And then it was opened up to Jason's uh, senior high and youth group. And there's a number of high school students that are going, as well as a family. The parents are the youth leaders at the church, and their two sons, a fifth and sixth grade boy, are going also. So um, we are going to be leaving on June 15th. Uh, we'll be down there through the 26th. Uh, the Lord has blessed us. Our finances have been well taken care of, and I'm thankful for that. However, we need your prayers. We need prayers through the time like from today on for our team, that everything will go well. Um, there's a great devotional book that um, we've been reading, Before You Go, it's called, and it tells of all the things that can happen. So it's very interesting to, <laughs> to at least prayerfully think of those things and just to at least accept that, yes, that may happen, but the Lord will still want us to go and to work through that. Pray that we'll work through that. Pray that we'll have health, um, strength, that we'll all get, the plane will be on time, you know, the, um, the way traveling goes in the summer with the weather, etc. And there are other things too. There's a, actually, there's a prayer list out um, outside of the office that if you would uh, sign up to pray, please, I'd appreciate that. There's a prayer card. Um, if you can limit it to one for a family, there's not a lot of them. And then I will have a, a box inside of the church office that has a short list of things that the children could use. Uh, there will be um, socks for the girls, not ankle socks, but ones that go straight and all sizes. The list will be there, as well as some um, stickers for kids, etc. So. I thank you very much for your time. I especially thank you for your prayers. And when I come back to give a testimony on this, I hope I know a little Spanish. So. <laughs> of course, if you know more Spanish, I won't be able to understand it. Anymore, so. <laughs> thank you, Linda. So we will have a list of stuff that, that we can help uh, collect uh, to go with her to be part of that ministry. But the biggest thing is, as uh, her church family, is to do our responsibility and intercessory prayer holding the whole team and uh, leading an effort. So let's take our hymn books and let's turn to number 496 and let's sing Victory in Jesus.
our children for Children's Church. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11 in your Bibles. A happy Memorial Day weekend to you all. You know, the birthplace of it was right here in our own Waterloo. Well, at least that's what most people say. There are about two dozen different states. All the northern states adopted uh, Decoration Day as an official holiday to decorate the, the graves. Um, originally, it was only for the Civil War soldiers. Um, and so none of the southern states <laughs> would adopt that. It wasn't until after World War I when uh, <coughs> Memorial Day became a day when we honored uh, soldiers uh, who died in all uh, U.S. battles that uh, many of the southern states then joined in. Uh, many of the southern states, I think there's 12 of them, still have their own special commemoration for the Confederate soldiers that died mm -hmm. also. Anyways, that's right here uh, in, in, uh, in Waterloo that uh, was the birthplace. Uh, in 1971, Congress changed it from May 30th to the last day in the last Monday in May, the observance. You know, thinking back, 1971, during the Vietnam War, they didn't have anything better to do, so they decided to talk about changing the date. I don't yeah. know. Anyways, that's why we celebrate it. Um, but it's not just for those who died. Um, many, if you notice in the paper, uh, many of the parades and many of the uh, memorials are really dedicated and in honoring of all people who served in our in our armed services over the years. Those who made sacrifices, many of them uh, did not go off to war, but stayed at home and uh, sacrificed for the cause of the war. And uh, their sacrifices are no less important and no less appreciated. Um, all gave some, some gave all, and uh, we certainly honor those. We honor those of our own church uh, who served in the armed forces. We think of Don Dickinson and Harold Lester and Boyd Vast and some others who, uh, who have already died and gone to be with the Lord, but uh, others in our church, Mickey Albright, and Jan West, uh, Kevin Andrew, and Dan Venable, Fran Brusso, Josh, Dan, Gary, Vance, Jeff, and others who, who served our country. And uh, I just heard that Chad has enlisted in the National Guard. So our congratulations there and prayers for Chad as he uh, goes off. Uh, when will he be heading off to boot camp? June 16th. All right. So just a month away. Okay. But we certainly, from the bottom of our hearts, thank those who uh, have given of themselves and sacrificed uh, to serve our country. And it reminds me of a list that God has given to us in Hebrews chapter 11. <laughs> He's sort of given us a memorial list, a, a, a memorial gallery, if you will, of some heroes that he doesn't want you to forget. And so if you turn to Hebrews chapter 11, you want to take a look at this memorial gallery of God's heroes. There's a phrase found down in verse 16 that I want you to note. It's uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 16 says this. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. And notice this. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. God is not ashamed to be called their God. That phrase really hits me. Because there's many, many times, many days that I think to myself, is God ashamed of me? I'm ashamed of myself. I'm sure my mom and dad were ashamed of me at times. But what would God say? <laughs> and so that statement just really sticks out. That of these people, it says God is not ashamed to be called before God. <laughs> I want to go back and look at this passage. Let's begin in verse 1 of chapter 11. It says, now faith... And faith is really the subject of this chapter. And he's going to talk a little bit about what faith, true faith is, real faith, saving faith, living faith, genuine faith is. 
And then he's going to talk in the rest of the chapter about some of these great people down through the centuries who were possessed of this genuine faith and uh, of the change it made in their life. So he says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. Now the elders, he's talking about the old folks, people who lived centuries ago, and uh, people like Enoch and Noah and Moses and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, uh, Rahab, Gideon, those men and women who exhibited faith, those are the elders. And he says, it was by their faith that they had such a good testimony, a good witness of their life. And that's what verse 2 means. Uh, those elders, those old folks. By the way, they weren't all old. Some of them died at a young age, but they lived a long time ago. So by faith, verse 3, it's by faith that we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen, <laughs> what we have in our visible universe here, what we can actually see, was not made of things which are visible. <laughs> God spoke it into existence. You say, how can that be? How can you explain that scientifically? I don't have to. By faith. By faith, I understand that God spoke the worlds into existence. In fact, not only just spoke them, created them, but framed them. Framed them means that he created them in an orderly fashion so that they function. So that it was a system. So that the galaxies and the sun rotated and everything fit perfectly. And, and the animals and the the wildlife and the, everything grows and does what it's supposed to do. And my body is a system that functions together. And, and you say, well, it's evolved. No, God framed it all. He, he formed it to function properly, outfitted it. What a phenomenal thing. And, and how do we understand it? Simply by faith. <coughs> by faith. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch was taken away so he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. Because before this, he had the testimony that he pleased God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, never heard of a flood, never heard of rain, but by faith he obeyed, prepared an ark. Verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Remember, God says, just go. <laughs> leave her, leave your family, and go, and, and I'll show you where to go. And he went, obedient. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of, with him of the same promise. But you notice he, he was living in a tent. He never, he never owned a permanent place. God, God had promised him that land, but he only lived there as a stranger, a sojourner, pilgrim. <coughs> he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. She bore a child and she passed the age because she judged him faithful who promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars, as the stars of the sky, and multitude innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Notice what it says here in verse 13. These all died in faith. These all. It can go back to referring to back in verse 4, Abel, and verse 5, Enoch, and verse 7, uh, uh, Noah. But, but I think probably the, the main reference, these all they were, were the, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It says these all died in faith. They died just as they lived. Um, I know a lot of people report deathbed conversions, you know. Well, he wasn't saved, but there is last dying breath. He, he trusted Christ. And... And I know that that's possible and that there are some genuine deathbed conversions, but I think for the most part people live and die the same. And uh, these people, they died, but it says, it says, it says they all died in faith. They also lived their lives by faith, but the idea here is that they died believing the promises, but haven't received them. They hadn't become partakers of the promises yet. It says, these all died in faith. <laughs> they died still believing, but not having received the promises yet. Isn't that something? They lived their whole life 
believing the promise of God and they never received it. <coughs> God's timing is not ours, is it? Amen. But they died. They lived their whole life in faith, in obedience to God, doing what He said, going where He said to go. They believed Him. Now, by the way, they weren't sinless. The fact that they died in faith, they lived by faith, they were possessed of a genuine faith that drove them to be obedient to God and committed to God. These patriarchs were full of sin too. You do know that. They were a light passion of you and I. And uh, there was deceit and guile and lies and hypocrisy at times and incest and polygamy. <coughs> Yet overall, their life, they had a genuine faith in God. They were His chosen people. And even though they had lapses and sinful episodes and situations in their life, the overall character is they trusted God and their lives were built and regulated upon the promise of God for eternity. And, and even though they didn't receive it in this life, they will. They died believing. So they all died in faith not having received the promises. So they died, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph is not technically one of the uh, patriarchs, but that he's listed here. Um, the promises. And it says that they, they died not having received the promises. Uh, they weren't dwelling in the land. They were just soldiers. They didn't own it yet. God had promised to give it to them as an eternal inheritance. But they didn't have it yet. They hadn't received it. They weren't dwellers in the land. They hadn't seen their offspring number the sands of the sea or the stars of the sky. Uh, they, they weren't dwelling in a heavenly Jerusalem built by God. Still future, they will. The kingdom of heaven had not yet become the kingdom of this world. Or the kingdoms of this world had not yet become the kingdom of heaven, I should say. The kingdom of God. And so they died believing the promises but hadn't received them yet. What does it say they did? It says they saw the promises afar off. This is great. Having seen them afar off, they were able to, with the eye of faith, see the fulfillment of the promise, even though they hadn't received it. All their life, for years and years and years, God promised, God promised, God promised, God promised. And they were able to see, look with their eyes, the eye of faith, above and beyond their temporal circumstances, and look to the future fulfillment. Someday, someday God's promise will come true. They were able to visualize that. They could envision what it's going to be like when God does fulfill the promise. Do you see that? Do you ever look ahead, get your eyes off of your present circumstances, off your problems in this world, to the fulfillment of those promises of eternity? Mm -hmm. Quit looking here and look to the fulfillment. See them afar off. See those promises in the future. Say sometimes, oh, I prayed for healing. I didn't get it, but God promised it. Yeah, but <laughs> that healing may be in eternity, not right now. God never promises healing in this life. Promised healing, but not necessarily here and now. I guarantee someday you'll be healed. You'll be living in a perfect body. Amen. I'm going through grief and trauma and, and trials. Someday those will be over. God promised someday they'll be over. But right now, he didn't promise. And there's death and there's pain and there's sorrow. He didn't promise it. But someday he promised that he's going to wipe every tear from their eyes and that there will be no more death, nor pain, nor sorrow, nor crying, for the former things will have passed away. Get your eyes off of this present circumstances and your job tomorrow and your schooling and the problem relationships with people. Get your eyes on eternity and the fulfillment of God's promises. See them afar off. Envision the fulfillment of them. And it's glorious. That's why we can sing these songs. Oh, that will be glory. Right? What's, is it glory now? Not really. The glory's in the future. And Paul says that the sufferings of this present time aren't even worthy to be compared to the glory that should be revealed in us in the future. Oh, see them afar off. You say, well, what are some of those promises? Here, let me tell you a few of these promises. I just did a very cursory summary of some of the promises of God I can think of. And by the way, 
Uh, one place I read said that there are some 3,000 promises of God in the Bible. I don't know how accurate that statement is, but there's a lot. Uh, but not all the promises in the book are ours, okay? I know there's a song that says they all are, but they aren't, okay? Many of the promises of God, he made specific promises to specific people that had to do with a specific situation in their life at that time. We can't just say, oh, that's me and expect it to be fulfilled. But, but there are hundreds and hundreds that are promises that God has made to his people in general that we can, can uh, stake our lives on. We should be singing that song, Standing on the Promises, huh? <laughs> Anyways, uh, Joshua talks about that the, the, the Lord my God will be with me wherever I go. Isaiah, that God will keep me in perfect peace if my mind is stayed on Him. And those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And Matthew chapter 6 says, I'm worth more to God than the sparrows which He cares for, or the lilies of the field in all their beauty. And whoever receives Christ becomes a child of God, is given eternal life, is under no condemnation, is crossed over from death to life. And Romans 8 says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And Romans 8 says that our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. And Romans 8 says that the Holy Spirit will help us pray. And that all things work together for my good in being conformed to the image of His Son. And that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And that nothing, death, height, angels, principalities, power, nothing will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And that God's will, Romans chapter 12, is always good and pleasing and perfect. And that God is prepared for those who love him. And the things that God has prepared for those who love Him are beyond comprehension or even our imagination. The half cannot be fancied. This side of the golden shore. And that our labor <coughs> is not in vain in the Lord. Whenever you serve, don't be weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Anyway, some of these promises, they saw them. They saw the ultimate fulfillment and that's what drove them in their life. The next phrase in Hebrews chapter 11, it not only says that they, this is verse 13, it not only saw them afar off, but it says we're assured of them or persuaded of them. They were convinced, absolutely true. God is a God of truth. God cannot lie. God promised. And they believed it. Absolute persuasion and confidence that what God says, He will do when He, in His timing, I don't have to know when. I know he will when it's right. And they were persuaded of that. We go back to verse 1. Remember that where he says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. These aren't things we can see. Matter of fact, verse 1 is actually Hebrew poetry. The first line parallels the second line. You have a synonymous parallelism here. And so faith in his description. Faith is the substance. It's it's the, uh, it's the reality. It's the something we can grasp onto and hold. It's the substance of what we're hoping for that we can't see out there in the future, the invisible, the, that what we're longing for. But faith makes it a reality and something to grasp on. The second phrase, it is the evidence of things not seen. God makes a promise. We can't literally see the fulfillment of it yet. But by faith, we have the evidence that it's true. In other words, it's like, it's the hard facts. It's, um, it's uh, not circumstantial evidence. What's the other thing? Empirical evidence. <laughs> Here it is. Here's the smoking gun with the fingerprints on it. It's proof. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's what we have. We have empirical evidence. Faith is that. Even though I can't see, I can't touch, I can look with my eye of faith and I have the evidence. Faith is the evidence that it's true. It's the foundation. And, and so these people were persuaded of it. Uh, uh, they, they understood it beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's what true saving faith is. A lot of people talk about getting religion, going to church, being a Christian. But here in chapter 11, he's explaining what genuine faith is. Faith is 
when we see the promises of God, we actually can visualize the reality of it, and that faith, it becomes the substance of it. It becomes the hard evidence, so that we say, we can, by faith, there is not a shred of doubt in my mind, but that God is faithful and will do exactly what he said. And his promises are true, and they will be fulfilled. That, uh, if, you, if you leave your, uh, no, don't leave it, I'll just quote the verse to you about Abraham in, in Romans chapter 4. It says, he staggered not at the promise of God to unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving God the glory, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Strong in faith, not wavering, not staggering, fully persuaded, absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt, that what God had promised, are you persuaded of the promises? Here, let me give you some more of the promises in case you didn't get enough. God always leads us in triumph and through us makes manifest the savor of His knowledge in every place. That we are being transformed into His likeness, 2 Corinthians 3. That God comforts the downcast. Me too. That whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows generously will reap generously, and that God is able to make all grace abound, and so that he will meet our needs. God's grace is sufficient. Do you believe that? Amen. That you have an inheritance laid up for you in glory? <laughs> that you've been brought nigh by the blood of Christ, that through him you have been brought into a relationship with God and Christ? that you can approach God with freedom and confidence, and that God is able to do immeasurably more than you could ask or think, and that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of redemption, that at the name of Jesus someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You say, we're outnumbered in this earth now, and people laugh at me. Envision the day when they will be bowing the knee to God Almighty. You see, you just got to see the vision, <laughs> see the prophecies fulfilled. <laughs> that God works in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. That the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds. That God will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. Amen. That the Father has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the, of, the, of the saints of light in light. And that we've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the realm, into the sphere, the kingdom of His own beloved Son. We've been reconciled to God through Christ's death and that He will present us holy in His sight someday, blameless and apart from any accusation. That God has made us alive with Christ and has forgiven all of our sin. And that we've been raised with Christ and our life is now hidden with Christ in God. And that when Christ, who is our life, appears, we shall appear with Him in glory. And we shall be made like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. that someday the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall be raised first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will all be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Talk about great. I hope you're persuaded of these promises. And you can envision the fulfillment of them. Amen. Not right today, maybe. Not tomorrow, not next week. Someday God is going to fulfill all these promises. And not only were they persuaded absolute confidence in them beyond a shadow of a doubt, but it says they embraced them. The long arms of faith reached out and embraced these promises of God. <coughs> embraced as you would you, your spouse or your child. Embraced because you will love these promises. Embraced because they are dear to your heart. I need these. I want these. And I believe in them. They embrace these. The word embrace there it means that they, 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 they long for them. They, they, they enfold them in their arms. I think it talks about the, an affection and a love for these promises. 
Why? Because they're God's promises. God said it. And God is a God of truth. So they, they embrace these promises. You want to hear some more promises? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and God is faithful, and He said He will sanctify me. And God will repay with trouble those who trouble me. And that God will ultimately reward all believers who suffer for the sake of the gospel. And that godliness with contentment is great gain. And that He has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind, not one of fear. And that the Lord will award the crown of righteousness to all who love His appearing. And that the Lord will rescue us from every evil attack and bring us safely to His heavenly kingdom. And God won't lie to me because God cannot lie. And that Jesus will help me when I'm tempted, Hebrews says. And that the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. And that the very trials that God sends are for my benefit and used to refine and perfect me. And that if I ask for wisdom, He will give it to me. And if I ask, he will answer. And when I pray, he will show me great and mighty things which we can't even imagine. And if I resist the devil, James 4, he'll take a hike. And if I draw near to God, he will draw near to me. And prayer is effective. And he cares for me. And after I have suffered a while, he will strengthen, confirm, and establish me. 2 Peter 3 says, And we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which dwells righteousness. And that He forgives and cleanses me when I confess my sin to Him. And that when Jesus reappears, I'll be made like Him. And that He has given to me eternal life promises. Do you embrace the promises of God? Do you even know them? Some people don't. They, they haven't seen the promises of God. They don't know them. They haven't heard about them. Because they don't read their Bible. They don't study their Bible. They don't go to church. They don't know the promises of God, let alone being able to see them in their fulfillment afar off and, and embracing them and, and, and claiming them as their own. Sad. Anyways, these saints here in, in, in this gallery of of heroes. They knew the promises of God and they clung to them. They regulated their life by them. These aren't frivolous thoughts when we're talking about this, the promise of God. This is what the essence of Christianity is. This is true Christianity. Genuine faith. And when it comes time, when we talk about salvation, it's the promise of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's a promise. Believe. Well, when, I, when he says believe, he's not talking about just, well, I'm going to start going to church. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ means see that promise in its fulfillment. Be fully persuaded that if I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work, He will save me, forgive my sin, give me eternal life. Embrace that. Stake my life on that. Live my life according to that promise. That's what that means. Do you envision that? Can you see that? Can you see yourself standing before the judgment of God someday, standing before Almighty God of the universe? What's it going to be like? You're going to stand there and say, Oh, God, I've got some good works here to offer you. Oh, yes, I don't. Hmm. Well, I'm, pretty, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty good mom, pretty good dad, pretty good citizen. I serve my country. Good neighbor, help people. <laughs> I hope that's not what you envision when you get to heaven. Because <laughs> you know where you're going? When your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, you envision standing before God and Christ alongside you. Through Christ alone. Christ died for me. My sins were completely paid for by Jesus on the cross. His righteousness is the righteousness in which I am clothed. I stand before Almighty God with Jesus as my Savior. That's, and I have complete confidence. That's what I envision on the day of judgment. I'm persuaded of that, and I'm living my life according to that. <clears throat> All the promises of God in Him are yes and in Him, Amen. 
we don't have time to get into this, but all of God's promises will be fulfilled and it's based upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. All the, the whole eschatological, that is the future fulfillment of this universe, when Christ comes again, the tribulation, the second coming, the judgments, the resurrections, all that is based on the fact that Jesus died at Calvary. In Christ, everything is yes and amen. God's promises are sure. Well, let's get back to Hebrews chapter 11. Not only the promises, they saw, they were persuaded, and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. They confessed, homo legato, and they, they said the same thing. People said to them, you're weird, you're different, you're not part of uh, this world, you're not part of our country, are you? And they said, that's right, no, we're, not. we're the children of God, we're on a mission. We're just traveling through this world, we're pilgrims here, we're just strangers. Someday this land will be ours, but not right now. That's right, I'm different. That's right. I'm not of this world. I, I'm living in this world, but I'm not of this world. That's right, I'm a child of God. That's right, I'm living my life according to His promises. That's right, I'm obeying God. That's right, my philosophies are different. That's right, my ambitions are different. That's right, my, my affections are different than all yours. Because I'm serving the Lord God Almighty. That's the only voice that I'm listening to. That's the only one I care about pleasing. This world really means nothing to me. I don't care about its engagement. I don't care about its applause. I don't care about its money or anything else. What I really care about is pleasing the Lord, Lord God Almighty. And so they confessed when people asked them or pointed their finger. They said, that's right. We're God's people. We're different. We live for different goals and different objectives and have different affections. We have a different master. That was their profession. Or their, they confessed that. And then it says in verse 14, for those who say such things, declare plainly that they seek a homeland. So, so they, didn't, they didn't try to hide their, their God-honoring faith. No, they publicized it. They declared it to anybody. That's right. Why are you doing that, Noah? Why are you, why are you building that boat? Because God told me to. We never heard of rain. We never heard of a flood. That's all right. I never did either, but God said I'm doing it. Mo, uh, 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 Abraham, why are you leaving Ur of the Chaldeans and, and going off someplace you don't even know? Because God said to I believe the promise of God, and I'm going to live my life in obedience to Him. And so they publicized their faith. They, they told people what it was. They declared plainly that they seek in a different world. And then the proof of that is the fact that they did not return to their old country. It says, verse 15, And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. Uh, particularly the patriarchs, came out of Ur of the Chaldeans, Mesopotamia. They had plenty of opportunities, time to return. <coughs> See, idea of times. Many times they could have turned and gone back. But their faith was genuine. Their obedience to God was real. And so they did not turn back. No, no. Remember, that's a little different than the people, the Israelites that came out of Egypt. The Israelites that came out of Egypt, for the most part, whether it was one or two million, we don't know how many, when God bought the Israelites out of Egypt, most of them were unsaved, ungodly, faithless people. They got out into the wilderness. They wanted to go back. They had a constant hankering to go back. They did not trust God, and that's why most of them perished in the wilderness. They did not see the promised land because they were unbelievers. <laughs> they, every opportunity they wanted to go back. But not the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. No. Their faith was genuine and they were obeying God and they saw the promises afar off. Even though they died and never received it in this life, doesn't matter. They saw the fulfillment of the promises and their life was based on that. And the proof of that faith was that they didn't turn and go back. In a Christian life today, there's a lot of opportunities to turn and go back to the old life. Your old friends, your old habits, your old contacts, your old cronies, old sinful mindset, old affections. You can go back and do the old things. But a person who's truly been born again by the Spirit of God and imbued with faith in the promises of God, they know a better way. They have a better hope. They have a better, they've got glory awaiting. The old way, the old broken sinful world, and its 
Yes, there are some pleasures associated, but those do not cause them to turn back. They're marching on. And that's the second thing. The proof, the second part of the proof is that they desired a better country. Not only did they not turn back, they had plenty of opportunity, but verse 16 says, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. They kept marching upward and onward. Forward we go, because God promised, and that's where we're going someday. Is that ever upward, onward, moving forward? Is that true in your life? Look at your own life. Do you publicly declare that you're a pilgrim in this life and that you're marching on to heavenly glory? Is your life one of genuine faith in the promises of God so that this world has lost its pull on you and, and what you really want and all you really want to do is go on to glory and to please your master? Are you concerned about growing and becoming more like Christ? Reading and becoming more obedient to his word and being conformed to his will? I know that we're not perfect, just like the patriarchs weren't. But if there's genuine faith in you, in the promises of God, it's a forward, upward climb. Not turning back. And then it says this great statement there in verse 6, and they desired a heavenly country. Therefore, God. Therefore, what based on? Well, because they demonstrated genuine faith in the promises of God that they saw and they embraced them, that they were persuaded of them, they embraced them, and then the proof that they didn't turn back, but that they kept moving forward in obedience to God, God says he's not ashamed to be called their God. In fact, that's what he says. Uh, remember when he called Moses, the burning bush? He says, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Talk about grace, speaking with just a little side note here. He calls himself the God of Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, numerous times in the Old Testament. He calls himself the God of Jacob more than any others, and yet Jacob was the least exemplary of a godly life. That's grace. Why did he do that? None of us, because he was justified. There's still faith in God, even though he had many lapses in his life and situations where he failed God and sinned. Still driven by the overall promises of God and an ultimate faith in God. God says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Isn't that a wonderful thing? God is not ashamed. God is not ashamed to be called our God. I know that he calls himself, I am the God of Shirley Dickinson. I am the God of Hazel Van Hall. I'm the God of Winnie Barber. I'm the God of Sandy Quantz. They've proven themselves true over the years that they have not turned back. They keep following after the promises of God. And God is not ashamed to be called their God. Well, in verses 22 and following, we don't have time, but he talks about by faith Moses in verse twenty or Joseph in verse twenty two verse twenty three Moses um, Rahab the harlot in verse thirty one um, verse thirty two what more? for time would fail me yeah it failed me this morning here too to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms worked righteousness obtained promises stopped the mouths of lions quenched the violence fire escaped the edge of the sword on and on wow. Great success by, by faith. But then there were others, verse 36. Others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword, wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and tormented. So God not only gives us this gallery of heroes of the faith, many of whom did great exploits, then there were the others who were persecuted and, and slain and killed and whatever else. Th th those were the purple hearts. But notice this next day, verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. Not only does God say, I'm not ashamed to be called their God because they live according to my promises. But he says that the world isn't worthy of those folks. They were being persecuted and hated by the world, treated as scum and disease. And yet God says the world is even worthy of them. 
a little difference between God's perspective and the world's perspective, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I hope you trust in God's perspective of you. Again, he comes back to verse 39. It's really coming back to verse 13. And all these, <coughs> they died in faith too, didn't they? They obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. Not in this life. They died. They were persecuted. They went through all sorts of suffering. And they didn't receive the promises yet even. But they will. What a wonderful thing. Just reminded of the Gettysburg Address. Abraham Lincoln said it's for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work. They who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. That's really what the author of Hebrews is saying too, isn't it? Closed up my Bible too soon, but Hebrews chapter 11 and 12. These, this list is given for our encouragement and to remind us that we also have a, a ministry and a work and a mission to do. And we may live in faith and not receive the fulfillment of it in this life. But we will. Keep at the work. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. We shall reap in due season if we faith not. And then he also says, from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not die in vain. Take increased devotion. Abraham Lincoln looked out over the graves, the stone markers, whatever markers they had at Gettysburg that day. And he says, by looking at those, we should take increased devotion. That's what the author of Hebrews says, because after chapter 11 comes chapter 12, and you notice what he says? Therefore, mm -hmm. we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all those people that I just mentioned, those heroes of the faith, who died living according to the promises, they're like surrounding us, cheering us on, encouraging us to go on and live by faith. We should also take increased devotion because of those who have gone on before and who have lived a life of faith and who will someday receive the promises just like us. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a great uh, gallery of people these were. And yet when we look at their individual lives as recorded for us in the scriptures, we realize that they weren't any different than us. They struggled in their families. They struggled in their jobs. They struggled with their tempers. They struggled with lust. They struggled with pride. They struggled with stubbornness. Because they were human. They'd been saved by the grace of God. They were trusting in the promises. But they had not yet been fully sanctified. And so they pushed on. Ever onward, ever upward, they grew closer to the Lord. And so that is our prayer, Father, that one, we would have genuine, true faith in God and in, in your promises. But secondly, that we would not become discouraged or ever turn back, but that we would continue to grow, <laughs> move onward and upward, always in your word, always meeting with your people to learn and grow and be challenged, to be encouraged, to be exhorted, to go on for Christ. And so, Father, we do take increased devotion from this great list, this gallery that you've given us of heroes. Make our lives like theirs, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing uh, hymn number 183, Faith of Our Fathers, Holy Faith. But we're not going to sing it. I'll just read the first verse. Living still, in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword, oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till then. Do you have that true, genuine faith? And will you be true to that faith till death? Will it be said of you that you died in faith, believing the promises of God? I hope so. Hope to see you tonight, 6 o'clock.